job. Uh, turn to Romans chapter 11. If you've uh, got your Bible today, hope you do. And uh, we've been in a series now for quite a while in the book of Romans. And uh, uh, to be honest with you today, I almost skipped this chapter. The first couple of times I read through this, I was looking, I was thinking, how in the world is this going to be applicable for our church? Because on the surface, it didn't seem like there was a whole lot of, of application, right? And, and not, not to mention, it can be kind of confusing. Paul talks about uh, engrafted branches and olive shoots and hard hearts. And, and uh, I heard about a guy who was preaching through Romans like we are in, in chapter 11. And, and the, the pastor stood up and said, look, I'm not sure what's going on in Romans 11. And I'm having a hard time seeing how it's relevant or edifying for us. Plus our VBS and student camps this week are coming up. And so let's just spend the morning praying about these. We'll pick up in Romans 12 next time. And so that's one way to do it, right? We could just sort of skip through it. We could spend some time praying or singing some more, you know, whatever it may be. But as I read this more and as I prayed more about it, I was just convinced, like, this is too important to skip over. And, and by the way, right, we don't want to talk just about the easy stuff here, right? I mean, whether it's a tough topic, a touchy social issue, a difficult passage of Scripture, this, like, I, I, this is where we need to deal with it, right? I don't want to be a church that's afraid to tackle the hard stuff, do you? I mean, let, let's talk about what's on your mind, and let's use the Word of God to be our guide in all things. And incredibly, Romans chapter 11 actually fits really well with what we're dealing with as a church, society, country, today, all of that. But before we get to chapter 11, we've got to go back and catch the original thought. This is a ladder. We, we have it broken up in divisions and uh, by chapters and verses, but Paul's writing a letter. So we've got, we're in chapter 11, but his original thought starts back in chapter 9. It actually begins in chapter 8, right? And remember in chapter 8, Paul lays out all these incredible promises of God, how there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, um, that, that God is for us, as these girls were singing about, that we can call him our father, Abba, Daddy, that God's working all things out for our good. Nothing can separate us from his love. Beautiful truths, amazing truths. But as he shares these things, he anticipates a question. And he anticipates a question coming from those who would have heard him sharing these things. And the question is, well then, okay, Paul, how do you explain the fact that so many Jews have rejected Jesus? I mean, how do you explain the fact that it seems like God's plan of redemption has failed? And so Paul spends chapters 9 through 11 answering this dilemma. Did God's word fail? Was God's plan for salvation somehow faulty since so many Jews have rejected Jesus? And while you and I probably haven't wondered about that specifically on this side of the cross some 2,000 years, but I bet you that you've had times in your life when you thought, God, what are you up to? Like, I, God, I, what, like, has your word failed? Like, is your program off the rails somehow? I mean, maybe in the midst of uncertain times, in the midst of chaos, you, know, you think, God, are you truly, are you really in control? And the truth be told, you've probably questioned about God, you know, God about something this year, right? Again, we're in this, like 2020 is un, it's, it's different than any I've ever dealt with. Probably you as well, right? We're dealing with, we're still in this pandemic. We've had over 100,000 people have died from this, from this disease. We've, we're dealing with all the tragic things we're seeing on the news. Some of you have had to deal with personal tragedy and disappointment in your life. And in the midst of all this, you're probably wondering, God, well, What's going on? I mean, like, is, is your plan failed somehow? Is, like, is, is something all, like, have you forgotten about us? But the Apostle Paul wants to remind us today that God's plan was never in jeopardy of failing. In fact, we're going to see today that sometimes when things appear to be hopeless or the darkest or bleakest, that that's when we can be maybe sometimes even the most confident that God is working 
I like how Lecrae said it on Twitter this week. He said, when it feels like nothing is working, God is. When it feels like nothing is working, God is. And this is, this is kind of what we want to, uh, I want you to see today in Romans 11. So let's dive into this text. We're going to start with verse 1. Look what it says. Paul writes, I ask then, did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Don't you know what Scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he appealed to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I'm the only one left, and they're trying to kill me. And what is God's answer to him? I've reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there's a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. And so again, the Apostle Paul is, is responding to this idea that since things don't seem to be right, since so many Jews are rejecting Jesus, that maybe somehow God's plan has failed. Listen, you and I, we are so limited to what God is up to in this world. Our mind, like we are just so incredibly limited to what God is up to. And it's natural for us often to think that God has blown it. Like, the, we're, you know, that something's off here, but we're not alone in this thought. The church was wondering about the same thing. The church was wondering about God's plan from the very beginning. And so Paul makes the point, God's not finished with Israel. He's not finished with the Jewish people, nor has he rejected them. He says a small group of them has remained, a remnant, right? And he gives an example from the past with Elijah. We'll get back to him in just a minute. And Paul says, and look, I am an Israelite. Right? I'm, from, you know, I'm a tr from the tribe of Benjamin. I am following Jesus. Right? Is that, listen, just because it appears that on the outside that things look bleak doesn't mean they are. God doesn't need circumstances to be pleasant to fulfill his plan. In fact, again, the point is when we, it feels like nothing is working, God is. When it feels like everything is off, God is doing a work. Look at verse 7. Paul writes, What then? What the people of Israel sought so earnestly, they did not obtain. The elect among them did, but the others were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that could not see and ears that could not hear, to this very day. And David says, May their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see, and their backs bent forever. And so again, even though it appears that God's plan is off track, Paul says, no, no, this is not the case. And he says the reason that so many Jews have rejected Christ, did you catch this? what he said? He says because God has hardened their hearts. Now this seems really odd to us. Why would God do that? Why would God harden their heart? But we see that, we saw this in chapter 9, that God does this sometimes to temporarily accomplish his greater good. Sometimes God uses means like this to uh, accomplish what he is up to. Remember what, how Jesus did this when he taught? Jesus often taught in ways that were parables. They were kind of riddles. They were difficult to understand. In fact, Jesus oftentimes when he would perform a miracle, what would he say? He'd be like, hey, y'all, don't tell anybody who I am, right? And we read that, we're like, why wouldn't you want to, uh, you know, to tell who you are, Jesus? Because the time isn't right, right? If they tell who I am too quickly, well, then they may force me to be the king, which they try to do at least on one occasion, or they may try to kill him before the proper time. And so Paul says God has hardened Israel, he gave them a spirit of stupor so they could not see or hear. But he says, according to verse 7, the elect obtained it. Right? So do you know what that means? Well, it means that just as Pharaoh's heart was initially hardened, remember we talked about this in chapter 9, initially it was hardened by his own self, that God comes in and does the same thing in, in Pharaoh's heart and hardens it. God is now using the hardening of Israel, their unbelief, for his greater good. But the elect who believed obtained it. The others were hardened. 
And Paul tells us a little bit later on, they were hardened again because of their unbelief. This isn't about them being you know, predetermined before they're born, salvation, none of that. But of course, this begs the question, right? Why? What's God up to? Why is he hardening hearts? Why is he you know, giving them eyes that they can't see? And what, what is God up to? Well, let's keep reading verse 11. Again, I ask, did they, Israel, the Jews, stumble as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if their transgression means riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their full inclusion bring? And so what was the purpose of their hardening? The purpose was so that the Gentiles could enter the church. See, the purpose was that people like you and me, who don't have any Jewish ancestry, can be part of the kingdom of God. Paul says they didn't stumble beyond recovery. They can still repent. Follow with me. But God used their unbelief for a period of time so that non-Jews could enter the church and then ultimately says so that the Jews would be jealous of that and want to be part of it as well. I, like a guy who breaks up with his girlfriend, after he breaks up with her, he's like, and she starts flirting with other guys or seeing other guys, like, whoa, I mean, I think I made a mistake, right? I, I need to go, I, I want to go back, right? This is God's plan. And this was incredible. You and I, we can't make this up, right? I mean, God would orchestrate this incredible plan. It looked like God's word had failed. It looked like that, that the Jews were just rejecting Jesus. And God's like, no, 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 are you kidding me? This was my plan along. This is what I was up to. God's building the church. And see, just when it feels like nothing's working, God is. When it feels like everything is broken, when everything is off the rails, when the program's off track, God's like, no, are you kidding me? This is what I had planned all along. Oh, look, just skip down to verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? <laughs> or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him all things to him be glory forever. Amen. I mean, God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. We, can't or we couldn't even dare to dream up a plan like this. Listen, y'all, when things look worse in your life, like when things sometimes look the worst, like that's the very moment maybe that God's doing his best work in you. I and mean, you've got to embrace it, though. I mean, God, sometimes he takes those moments where we think, man, this is messed up. And God's work, and see, God's word hadn't failed. God was building his church. Do you see this? He's building his church. Now, I want to notice a couple of things about the church that God was building. Number one, it would be culturally diverse. It would be culturally diverse. Now, we'll see what we see going on right here in chapter 11 ensures us that God had a multi-ethnic church in mind from the beginning. Right? See, it seems that Paul's saying, listen to this, follow with me. It seems like Paul's saying that had the Jews transitioned into mass, into the church, that the Gentiles would automatically feel like a second-class citizen. Right? Had the Jews just in mass just turned to Christ, then the church would be primarily a Jewish institution in the beginning, and everyone else would just feel like an add-on. And so while God used Israel to bring the Messiah, the church would be, would be involved with every tribe, people, tongue, and language. And that's exactly what we saw 20 or 30 years earlier at Pentecost. Remember what happened at Pentecost? The church gets started in Acts chapter 2. The Holy Spirit came on the disciples. All were gathered there in Jerusalem. And everybody heard them speaking in their native language. You know who was there at Pentecost? People, Europeans. Africans, Arabs, Jews, you name it. The church started diverse. And the church was multi-ethnic from the very beginning. God's plan was that the church would be culturally diverse. It was not just going to be one group of people. It's going to be all people. But the history in this 
country. And let's just be, let's just be, uh, let's, let's not be afraid to talk about difficult things I said earlier. Let's be honest that the history in our country, and particularly the white church, it's not great. In fact, it's ugly, it's shameful, it's tragic, and we have to own it. And in fact, many of the race problems that continue in our country today are the result of years and years of the church either being silent or culpable on institutions like slavery or more modern like Jim Crow and other things. But we don't have to continue in those same sinful mistakes. And praise God, he's doing this incredible work and changing hearts and all. But listen, we've got so much work to do. We got so much work to do. And someone will say, well, you know what? I, I, don't, I don't know if I could worship with people who look different than me or who have a different accent or, or who come from a different country. Listen, if that's the case, the church isn't the organization for you. You're looking for a country club. You're looking for a bar. You're, you're looking for something else. If you truly want to be a New Testament church, and we talk about this sometimes here, like you know, the, the restoration movement is kind of like this is the, 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 the moving principle behind it. It's like we want to look like the, the early church. The early church was diverse. It was culturally diverse. It's something we continue to strive for. And not just simply diversity, but learning to love each other in the skin we're in. Like if we said it before, we're not color blind, we're color blessed, right? God showed us immediately that the church would be diverse. Can I tell you what this world needs more than ever right now? In the midst of Racial tension and social injustice and violent acts and lawlessness in the streets and fatherlessness and pregnancies being terminated and broken homes and general anxiety. The world needs the church. I mean, more than ever, this world needs the people of God acting like the people of God. They need to see the church leading the way. And let me say this. If God can use envy to make Israel jealous so that they would so that they would reach out for Jesus I'm confident that he will use a diverse yet unified body of believers to get the attention of a watching world people will see body but they'll tell that church down there Pratt Row you know, church in Baltimore like what's going on there All right there that church is different that they're they're just a different group of people I want to be part of that Martin Demise said it like this, there's no greater tool for evangelism than the witness of diverse believers walking, working, and worshiping God together as one in and through the local church. We've got to renew our efforts to be the body that looks like the neighborhood that God planted us in. Sunday morning continues to be the most segregated hour of our week, and for a diverse community like ours, that can't be the church would be culturally diverse from the very beginning god shows us that number two church is never going to be defeated it's never going to be defeated look go back to that example with elijah that paul gives us remember elijah's story elijah was a prophet in a really uncertain time in israel and uh, they, uh, Israel had turned their back against God. They were worshiping Baal. King Ahab and his wife Jezebel were causing all kinds of problems for, uh, for Israel, including killing God's prophets. And so God sends Elijah to this sweet couple, Ahab and Jezebel, and says, your time's up. Right, And after this big showdown that they have on, uh, that Elijah has with the, the prophets of Baal on, on Mount Carmel where he defeats 450 prophets, Elijah has a bounty put on his head. And so they're ready to kill him and Elijah has to run. And he goes off and he goes into the wilderness and he prays, God, don't let them strike me dead. You strike me dead instead. Elijah was ready to die. He said, God, your plan failed. Here I am. I'm running for my life. Yeah, that was a great victory, but it's off the rails. You've messed it. Like, it's, this, is not, this is not the way it's supposed to be. And that's when God says, are you kidding me? I got 7,000 people who haven't reserved, haven't bowed a knee to Baal. 
Like my program hasn't failed. I like listen, no matter how bad, no matter how bad things may look at times for the church, what the church will always remain until Jesus comes for. Churches will close their doors. Things may look bad, persecution may come, but none of it can stop the church. Let me make a prediction. I'm going to make a bold, big, bold prediction here. All right. Hostility towards the church is likely to increase in the coming years. I know that was bold and brash, right? Any, all of you can make that same thing. But persecution is coming. It exists in all parts of the world already. And, and if it hasn't landed here, it's, it's coming. But here's the thing. I'm going to be honest with you. Can we be honest again this morning? I'm not sure we're ready for it. I'm not sure that the church is ready for persecution. Dave Stone said, when, the church, when church attendance drops by 8% when it rains, or a time change weekend, when those things determine whether or not we'll worship God that day, it's not likely that we'll be able to withstand financial hardships, workplace abuse, or media pressure. Listen, if you're ashamed of Jesus at school, how are you going to stand up during persecution when things get really bad? I mean, if you spend more money on a week's vacation than you give to the Lord all year, I mean, you think, if you're a Christian because your mama was a Christian and that's just what y'all did and that's just your family, it helps your reputation, you know what, listen, you're not going to make it. If you only open your Bible on Sunday morning because, well, that's just kind of what we do at church, you probably won't be ready. I mean, more than ever, church, we got to get serious. It's time. If nothing else, let's wake up. This year, if nothing else, it ought to wake us up. Right? Let's get serious about our relationship with God. Put Jesus first in all you do. If you will humbly submit to him, your life will change from the inside out. No matter how bad things get, no matter what the world may look like, God's church will never be defeated. In fact, <laughs> when things appear bad, that's usually when God's doing his best work. That's why the church is growing. You know where the church is growing? It's growing in places like China and Africa and Latin America. Listen, when it feels like nothing else is working, God is. I mean, God is working. Like, we think, oh, it's, it's messed. Like, it's not. No, no. When it feels like everything's broke, when it feels like the plan's out the, out the window, God is doing a work. The church would be diverse. The church would be this incredible movement that will continue until Jesus returns. And then third, it would be marked by people who have gone from death to life. We will be marked by people who have been changed. Like, we won't, we're no longer the same. We have literally gone from being dead to being alive. Look at verse 13. Paul writes, I'm talking to you Gentiles. Inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I take pride in my ministry in hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. Let, let's keep going. Look at verse 17. If some of the branches have been broken off, and you, though wild olive shoot, have grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, do not consider yourself to be superior to those other branches. If you do, consider this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief. And you stand by faith. Don't, do not be arrogant, but tremble. See, Paul's warning the Gentiles who made up the, the majority of the church at Rome, don't be arrogant, right? Don't think that all of a sudden now this is about you. Right? God's plan for the church wasn't, was, you know, it was the inclusion of all people. It wasn't the exclusion of the Jews. And he explained this by using an illustration. He said that branches were broken off, right? But he said, don't think that they were broken off just because you're so special. They were broken off because of unbelief. And he says, don't get so cocky, right? Because the Jewish people were the root, and you're getting grafted into that. 
But the point he's making is that he doesn't want them to have the same attitude that the Jews had you know, regarding the law. Like, this is all about me. This is all about a certain group of people. No, no, church, who is this about? This is about the glory of God. This is about His mercy. And if I can be honest with you, this is why I think, I think sometimes this is why, as it pertains to this, this attitude, that why in 20, and we could say this in 2020, and we could say this of all churches, that sometimes why churches hesitate to reach other ethnic groups is because somehow they're afraid we may lose power. What if, you know, we may lose power, white, black, Hispanic, whatever it may be. But listen, the church was never about power or control. It's always been about self-sacrifice. The church, listen, y'all, the church has always been about the Christ we serve. That's who we are. That's what the church is about. The church has always been about the Christ that we serve. But notice the power of the gospel. Verse 15, Paul says the Jews would just choose to follow Jesus, that they would move from death to life. And I, we, we talked about this in Romans, like that this is the power of the gospel. That, that you, like the people who are living from Jesus, for Jesus literally go from being dead to alive. Death from life. If you are living apart from Christ today, listen, the Scripture, according to Scripture, you are literally the walking dead. And this may explain why some of you are still struggling with prejudice, with addictions, with sin on the calendar. You may not look dead, you may not feel dead, but apart from Jesus, you are cut off from the source of life. And if I could tell you honestly, this is why I do what I do. More than anything, I want you to know what abundant life in Jesus is. So many people are trying to find life in their career, relationships, countless other places, but you know what they discover? One dead end after another. So many people try to fill up their hearts with things that bring temporary satisfaction, pleasure, power, possessions, all of that. You know what it does? It never leaves them fully satisfied. They just want more and more and more. And I don't know how else to say this, and this may be theological. I don't know. Maybe you'll say I should say it better, but I'm just going to say it like this. Following Jesus works. I don't know how else to say it. I mean, putting Jesus first, seeking first His kingdom and everything you do, from who you date to what you watch to how you spend your money, life in general, like it's a game changer. It just, it just, like your values will change, your purpose will change, the way you see people will change, and you will go from simply just getting by in the world to thriving in it. And it doesn't mean that you're never going to have any troubles or not. I'm not saying that, but your view of all that will be changed. Listen, there is no way I would be a pastor had I not experienced this personally. There's way easier things to be doing. But I have gone from death to life because of Jesus, and you can too. Is this making sense? Just give me a nod, amen, you know, something, right? God's building His church. God's building his church, and he made, he's made a way for us through Jesus for you to be part of it. But be warned. And let me be, this is the warning part of the sermon, right? Be warned. that Most of us were happy for God to shower his mercy and grace on us, but the call of discipleship is real. Like there's, we're, we're called to lay it down for him. A few more verses, verse 21. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Consider, therefore, the kindness and sternness of God. Sternness to those who fail, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And if they do not persist in unbelief, they'll be grafted in, for God's able to graft them in again. After all, if you were cut out of an olive tree that was wild by nature and contrary to that nature were grafted in to a cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted in to their own olive tree? And so Paul says, why were the Jews, why were some of them cut off? 
because of unbelief. He says, well, they weren't cut off forever. He's willing to still save them, but they have to turn to him, how? In belief. And we said this last week, this, this isn't just simply easy believism. This isn't just simply like, hey, just, yeah, I believe, you know, whatever. An acknowledgement, it's a belief in God that's evidenced by heart change. And so for many of you today, like, this is a, this is a time for repentance. It's a time to say, God, you know what? My heart's not right. I, I, I do need to change. And Lord, I can't do this on my own. You're going to have to do it in me. And so that requires repentance. I mean, if God didn't spare the natural branches, he says, and this is not my words, okay, these are Paul's words. If God didn't spare the natural branches, he's not going to spare you either. If God didn't spare the Jews, if they rejected Christ and continue to reject, God's not going to spare us either. But I hope through all this, that you can see today that God's ways are incredible. That when it looks like God's plan has failed, God says, no, no, this thing had not, yeah, I haven't failed. This isn't off the rails. This is what I intended all along. When things appear to be hopeless, you can be confident that God is working. You know what? When the people of Israel left Egypt, you know, when Moses delivered them, you know what happened? They got out in the wilderness. They were heading to the promised land, and they said, you know what? I'm hungry. We should go back to Egypt. I think this plan is bad. They thought God's plan was messed up. On the night when Jesus was arrested, in the days following his crucifixion, it seemed like God's program was way off the tracks. Like, this was not right. This is not what I thought. When the church got started, you know what happened? It wasn't long until persecution broke out. And you know what happened after persecution? Everybody scattered. And you know the disciples had to think, this can't be God's plan. Something's got to be off here. This thing is messed up. And when so many Jews initially rejected Jesus, it seemed that God's plan was messed up. But Paul says, no, 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 no. When it feels like nothing else is working, God is. When it feels like the program is off, no, God is right. He's got things right where they need to be. What if, church, what if instead of being distraught about the events you watch on TV, you pay attention, what's God doing? What's he doing? What if instead of being crushed when things don't go exactly the way you think they should go in your life, you rejoice in the plan of God. What if, church, you don't so distraught about those things, but you say, you know what, God, when it fe- like I'm going to trust you. It feels like nothing else is working, but I want to trust that you are. I saw this quote from Leslie Dwight. Couldn't remember the name. So what if 2020 isn't canceled? What if 2020 is the year that we've been waiting for? A year so uncomfortable, so painful, so scary, so raw, that it finally forces us to grow. A year that screams so loud, finally awaking us from our ignorant slumber. A year we finally accept the need for change, declare the change, work for change, become the change. A year we finally band together instead of pushing each other further apart. 2020 isn't canceled, but rather the most important year of them all. Church, can you imagine what your life, how different your life would be if you just simply trusted that God's got this? That, yeah, it seems like nothing else is working. It seems like God's plan has failed. But no, no, he's, he's got you right where you need to be. Can you imagine how your own life, what that would look like? Probably a lot less worrying. Probably a lot less hand-wringing. And a lot more trust. Church, I, I believe that this year, I mean, it's different. It's It's uh, It's crazy. I would never imagine pews taped off and family separated. But I trust that God is up to something great. 
And I've been seeing some wonderful ways and some wonderful movement of God. And I know and I'm praying and I'm continuing just to trust that God's going to do a great work. He's going to do a great work in us. He's going to do a great work in you. When it feels like nothing else is working, God is. He's working in our church. He's working in our communities. And he's working in your life. We're going to sing a song. It's a song of commitment. And it's a song of, uh, uh, of worship. And, and uh, I'm not going to be able to meet you up front during an invitation time per se. But I'll, I'll be around after the, our service is over. And I'm happy to talk or pray with you or whatever it may be. Of course, you're welcome to come forward. If you, if you want to pray up front, you're welcome to do that or right wherever you are. Well, whatever it may be. But let's be standing, let's sing this, and let's cry out to God about His incredible, uh, His incredible will, His incredible ways, and let's just re- be reminded not only uh, as we worship, but in our own life, that it is well with our song. Let's sing.